I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. We're going to look at a few verses here. I'm going to talk to you today, tonight, about why do we worry? Why do we worry? We're all guilty of it. Everybody say amen. Because we are guilty of it. Before we read the scripture, a boy went to the store one day and he bought a box of Tide. And the cashier asked him, he said, young man, are you doing laundry for your mom? He said, no, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go home and wash my dog. And the cashier said, well, you know, that's not good for a dog. Well, that just kind of went through one ear and out the other. And so the boy came back a week later and the cashier said, well, how's your dog? He said, oh, my dog died. He said, uh, well, was it the tide that killed it? He said, no, I don't think it was the tide that killed it. It was the spin cycle. The rest of y'all get that in a little bit. But you know what? Life is kind of like that sometimes. We get in a spin cycle and sometimes we... We don't know how to get out, and sometimes it almost kills us. And that's what worry can do. And that's what we're going to kind of look at tonight in uh, Psalm 37. Look at verse 1. It says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So as we embark on this study tonight, we're going to think about the word fret. It says, do not fret. Now that's a strong word. It really means do not worry, but it really has a lot of meaning to it. And, and when I began to uh, dig deep into this, it was talking about that there is something that is on your mind that, uh, that just burns you up. In other words, you get heated up about something. You get worried about something and it, and it just kind of takes over your life. Well, David's message here in this psalm, and this is a psalm of David, by the way, and he was, he's an older man at this time, and he is reflecting back on uh, the issues of his life, and he's thinking back on times of his life where he had it hard, and he, he, he worried a lot. He's, he's human, right? And so his message to us in this particular chapter is we need to cool down and keep our cool. We don't need to get heated up. We need to cool off and to, and, and to keep cool. And the reason I think the, that the words fret not are here, and David writes about this, is because it will do three things to us. And the first thing it will do to us, it will corrupt our spirit. It will corrupt our spirit. It will make us feel down. It will make us feel stressed. And it tells us actually in verse 8 there in that same chapter that fretting can cause you harm. Now, none of us want to harm ourselves, right? So here's the thing. Now, say this with me. Don't worry. Be happy. Now, happiness is based upon happenstance. We know that. So really what the Lord wants you to do, He wants you to be joyful. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a little bit. But, but fretting or, or worrying is going to corrupt your spirit. Really, it says, I came up with this, and it says hurting yourself more than what you are fretting over. You think about that. We worry and assume about things sometimes that don't even come to pass, right? And so we've got to be careful because hurting ourselves, it can hurt ourselves more than what we are fretting over. But listen, it can also, not only is it, can it corrupt your spirit, but it is contagious to the saints. It can be contagious to the people you're around. And, I, and I'm always around Christian people. Now, one of the things that I, I love to be around, I love to be around somebody that's very positive, somebody that's joyful. They, they, uh, they have Christ in their life and they live that. And, and, and I, I want to do that. I want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be somebody that is going to give me something. I don't want to be a contagious Christian when it comes to worry. Because you know what? If I start worrying, it's going to rub off on my wife. 
If, if, if she starts worrying, it's going to rub off on her kid. You, you, you get the idea? It becomes contagious. And I'm going to tell you this as a friend tonight. Don't give it to me. So don't be a worrier, okay? Don't worry. Ah, Y'all catch on here in a minute. So it can corrupt your spirit, but it, can also, it will also be contagious to those around you. But the third thing is it can be confusing to sinners. You think about it. How, how are we supposed to live? Are we supposed to live uh, like worry warts? Not at all. Now what if there's somebody out there that's not a child of God and they see you in a despondent way, in a, in a worrisome way, and, and uh, you're not trusting in the Lord and all that? Don't you think that's going to uh, make a difference to them? Certainly it will. So it can be confusing to sinners. Listen, somebody is always watching you as a Christian. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, I want you to notice something here in this chapter, beginning at verse 25. First of all, it tells us uh, in this particular passage that uh, we are not to worry. Notice in verse 25, it says, do not worry. Okay, you see that? And then it says in verse 28, it says, do you worry? And then in verse 31, it says again, do not worry. So listen to this passage. This is the words of Christ. This is what Jesus tells us to do. He says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first, not second, not third. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, why do we worry? Well, there's a couple of reasons I, I thought of that I think are main reasons why we worry. Number one, we worry because we're constantly trying to figure out how to solve problems. Now, think about that. I'm known as a fixer. I like to fix things. You know, whether it's emotional, mental, whatever. I like to counsel people and try to help fix things. But the second is we worry because we have a fear of losing control. But let me remind you what he says here, what the Bible says. Fret not, because it can harm you. It can be contagious to those who are around you. And it can confuse those of the world. So fret not. Don't let it burn in the inside. Keep it cool, okay? Secondly, not only are we to fret not, we are to rely on. What are we to rely on? Well, it says here in verse number three, trust in the Lord and do what? Do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So we are to rely on God's faithfulness. Think about Moses for a moment. He has led the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He has come upon the Red Sea, and the army of Pharaoh has come up behind them. And uh, he has two million plus people that he is responsible for. And God tells Moses, says, Moses, I want you to just stretch out your rod over the water. Don't you think he relied on God for that? Don't you think he trusted in the faithfulness 
of Almighty God because when he put that rod over, what happened? The water split and they walked on dry ground to, to safety. And we remember the rest of the story how Pharaoh's army all drowned. And so Moses relied on the faithfulness of God. What about Gideon? He had a lot more men when he started. But going against thousands upon thousands, the Lord narrowed it down to 300 people. Do you think he had to rely on God? Absolutely. He relied on the faithfulness of God. And Gideon and his 300 men won the victory. What about Elijah? Elijah there, he's in the midst of the prophets of Baal and, and uh, he has an altar built, has water poured on it. Prophets of Baal, they couldn't, they couldn't summon anything. They couldn't, they couldn't make anything happen. And Elijah, relying on the faithfulness of God, called down fire from heaven. Do you think he trusted in God? Absolutely. And that fire uh, licked up all the water and, and destroyed the, the, uh, the, uh, the animal, and God got the victory. What about Paul and Silas? They're in a dark dungeon. They're chained, they're chained to guards, and at midnight, the Bible says, they began to sing, and they began to praise. Praise and pray. I'll tell you what, that's something we can do when worry starts coming in our life. We need to just pray to the Lord, and we need to sing praises to the Lord. And that's what they did. How could they do that? Well, they did that because they could rely on the faithfulness of God. Do you rely on the faithfulness of God? It says there in that verse, in verse 3, trust in the Lord. Let me give you three things about this. Number one, God supplies what you don't have. You don't have to worry about anything because God supplies what you don't have. And it tells us in Philippians 4.19, that great verse, And my God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. He knows exactly what I need. It's not my wants that he is concerned with. Now, I get some of the wants every now and then, but he, he always supplies the need that I have. And he's always, he has never failed. But not only will God supply what you don't have, listen what God will do. He will sustain what you already have. Now, you think about it. I, it's amazing how, how much he makes money go, how, how far he can make it go and how far he can make it reach. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the mailbox and I've opened up a check and it would be exactly the amount of a bill that I had in, in sitting in my office. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. He knows how to make things. He knows how to sustain things. He knows, he knows exactly what we need. And, and uh, there's a verse that says this in, uh, in uh, uh, Psalm 55, verse 22. It says, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Aren't you glad you got a God like that? Sustaining me, he holds you up. He keeps you where you need to be. He gives you what you need each and every day of your life. But that's not all. Not only will He supply what you don't have, and not only will He sustain what you already have, God will satisfy you about what you can't have. You know, God knows what's best, right? Now, I'm talking about that with every one of us individually. God knows exactly what you need. But not only that, God knows exactly what you don't need. And there's some things you may think you need that God says no. And he says you can't have it. So what's God trying to do? He wants you to put your satisfaction in who he is, not what he does for you. And we need to do that. We need to give glory to God uh, in everything uh, that he does for us, even in the things that we can't have. Kind of like, you know, when my kids were little, you know, Christmas time would roll around and they'd say, they would say, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I said, listen, you really can't have that. Well, why? Because you're not big enough. It's not right for you. 
You know, and as a, as a parent, we have the right to do that, right? We have a right to protect them and, and to keep them from harm. And that's exactly what our Heavenly Father does when He says you can't have that. And here's this, folks. Don't get upset with God if you can't have something, okay? A lot of people blame God for things. You can't do that. Don't do that. And, li and listen, don't worry about the stuff you can't have. <laughs> because remember, He'll sustain what you do have, and He'll give you what you need. And that's more important than what you can't have. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, verse 25, it says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor His children begging for bread. What a God. So he says that we are to rely on his faithfulness. We're not to fret because it will corrupt our spirit. It will be contagious to those around us. It will confuse others. Relying on his faithfulness means God supplies, God sustains, and God satisfies. And the third and last thing tonight, verse 4 tells us to rejoice in His fellowship. How many of you love the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in Christ? We all do. But how much more important is it to have fellowship with our Father in heaven? Because here's the thing. If you don't have fellowship with your Father, you're not going to have good fellowship with anybody else. So it stems upon the relationship that you have with your Heavenly Father. I had the privilege just a couple of days ago to preach a funeral for a family that had no pastor, and I had no idea who this person was, and they called me and asked if I would do it, and, and I got to share the Gospel. Because that's what you do. When you don't know if someone's in heaven or hell, you, you share the Gospel. You don't get up there and say, hey, this was a good person, and I know he's in the arms of God, because I didn't know that. And had a couple, two family members come up to me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for preaching the Gospel. Because I think we're the only two that know who Jesus is. Now that's sad in a way. They lived in Kentucky and you know they, they're not here very often and so they're not around them. But I'm thankful they, they know who Jesus is and they have, a fellowship, they have fellowship with God. But listen, we've got so many people in our world that need to, to, to have a relationship, and then they can have fellowship with God. Now notice it said here in verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now listen, if you want to write this down, do so, okay? If you get your desires before your delight, you will not have delight in your desires. Let me say that one more time. If you get your desires before your delight, and who are we to be delighting in? In God, right? So if you get your desires before your delight, you will not have delight in your desires. Don't you want God in don't you want God orchestrating the desires of your heart? Absolutely. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You want God to be speaking things into your heart and, and godly things speaking into your heart, not worldly things. And so we need to rejoice in the fellowship that we have with, with the Lord. Now, he tells us in 1 John chapter 2, he says, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that particular chapter is written to Christian people. The books of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are written to Christian people. And so he's not talking about salvation there. He's talking about being cleansed and getting back into a right fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Fellowship with God. And I don't know about you, but when you're out of fellowship with God, you know it, right? I mean, it's not hard to realize uh, because your life's not going to go right. Uh, you're not going to have delight in things that, 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 uh, of the Lord, and, and you're just, you're just going to be kind of lost a little bit. 
Now, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm just talking about you're not right with God. And you need to be right with God. If we want to live lives of full happiness, we will seek to be thoroughly pleased with God's desires for our life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. The Apostle Paul pens this, and I think it really speaks volumes. He said, not that I speak, in verse 11 of chapter 4, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then that great verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Folks, you need to be in fellowship with Christ. And you need to rejoice and be happy within it. Now, we don't have time tonight to go through the, uh, all the way through to verse number 8, but I want to I point out to you that not only we are trust in the Lord and delight in the Lord, but we're to commit to the Lord. It says down there that we are to commit. Commit means this. Take the whole of one's life. In other words, take every bit of who you are and give it to God. That's commitment. Then he says later on, he says, rest in the Lord. Any of you tired? Do you get tired? We can get tired physically, mentally. I guess we can even get tired spiritually. But you know what? We need to get energized by the Lord. He says, rest. And we know what that means. You know what it means to rest in the Lord? It means to be silent before the Lord in the calmness of faith. Be silent in the Lord in the calmness of faith. In other words, you live your life knowing God's got this. I don't have to worry about anything. And so, folks, don't worry. This side still gets it. Don't worry. Be happy. Be happy in Jesus. That's what I'm trying to say to you tonight. And I hope and pray that, that uh, you'll trust and continue to trust in the One who knows who you are. Trust in the One who has a purpose for your life. And trust in the One that is working that purpose through your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and thank You for this uh, passage in the book of Psalm. Lord, that can speak volumes to our heart. And Lord, I do pray that we won't be people of worry. That we will delight in You. We will trust in You. We will commit to You. And we will rest in You. So God, I pray as we continue on in our, with our prayer time, Lord, that You will just embrace each and every one here. Lord, as we look at our prayer list, I pray you will just continue touching the hearts and lives of those people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.